My family were railway people, and we lived beside the tracks all our lives. My father was a fettler, and he worked on the lines in the outback. My mother was a station mistress at small sidings. Your house was right there. At nights, you'd hear the trains come rumbling by and then fading and wailing off into the distance. Since then, I've spent a great deal of my life searching out the folklore and history of railways and railway men. I can still hear the sound of those wheels, and to me, it's the whole of Australia's foundation. The railway had its beginnings in Australia when the first steam locomotive ran in 1854 between Melbourne and its port, Sandwich. From this small beginning, railways spread out rapidly from the capital cities to serve the needs of the growing colonies. There have been some changes since those early days. The Prospector runs between Perth and Kalgoorlie in Western Australia. It's one of Australia's fastest and most modern trains. In 1912, work was begun on the Transcontinental Railway. This linked the East with the West and fulfilled one of the conditions upon which Western Australia joined the Commonwealth. It was a terrific achievement. 1,400 kilometres without a stream of water, without a town or a village. All supplies, everything, had to be brought in along the new line. For six days a week, the navvies built a mile of railway every day. In recent years, there's been a new growth in railway construction. The Commonwealth, through Australian National Railways, is building a new line to Alice Springs in the heart of the continent. The old line used to be subject to disruption for weeks at a time by the floods which sweep across the desert every few years. The new line has been rerouted to avoid these problems. on concrete sleepers, the new line will require very little maintenance. The rails are being welded into continuous lengths of up to 80 kilometres.
early days of railway construction in Australia, the different states just would not agree on one standard gauge. The width of track varied from state to state. What is a gauge? Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, Perth. Names he's only heard of. Foreign lands beyond the little island of his state. How can he ever see them? How can he ever know his country? Understand the men who make it? How locked up in his little island state can he ever share in this our commonwealth? Somewhere across a sea of borders are men and women in their island states. But try and go to see them. Aubrey, all change! What the hell? Wake the children. Grab the luggage. Find the ticket. Get a porter. We're changing trains. We're changing gauge. This is the border. This is the barrier between the states. I won't stay in this train. But we can't be it. Why? Because we have to change into another one. Why? Because this is as far as this one goes. Why? Because, oh, because it wants a rest. I don't know. Come on. Look in the other suitcase. No, they won't be in a suitcase. I always keep them in this pocket. A thousand passengers every day. Four thousand tons of freight every week. Men, women, children, babies, papers, parcels, pears, potatoes, plows, tractors, cultivators, turkeys, ducks, onions, apples, fowls, chickens, sheep and cattle, bulls, cows, iron, steel, timber, coal, and circuses. The misunderstandings and pig-headedness that saddled Australia with three different rail gauges have left modern generations with problems that still bedevil rail transport in this country. These problems have resulted in some bizarre solutions. In the early 50s, a pickerback train was used briefly between Lee Creek and Port Augusta in South Australia. Standard gauge flat top trucks were laid with three feet six inches track, permitting the entire narrow gauge train to travel to its destination without unloading. Since those days, the states and the Commonwealth have got together. The standard gauge has been extended. It's now possible to travel from one side of the continent to the other without changing trains. In the cities, too, railway systems are being updated. When our first railways were built back in the horse and buggy days, they helped to shape the growth of our cities. Now they're proving themselves one of the most efficient and non-polluting ways of moving large numbers of people. underground railways are going ahead in both Melbourne and Sydney, bypassing the traffic jams, tunnelling deep underground beneath the heart of the city.
it's not only city people who benefit from rail. In far off Normanton, in the Gulf of Carpentaria country of northern Queensland, a small line was built back in 1893. It only runs about 150 kilometres to a little town called Croydon, where gold was discovered. The gold ran out almost as the line reached Croydon, and that's where the line stopped. But a rail car still provides a weekly service to these small, isolated communities. It's a 1921 vintage AEC motor. And basically, it's a one-man band. The man, the driver. He's also the station master at Normanton. He's district engineer, he's traffic inspector. He sells you the ticket, if you're one of the extraordinarily rare number of people who have ever traveled on it. He tells you to get on board, and then he hops on and he calls out, are you OK? And off you go. chugs from Normanton to Croydon once a week on a Tuesday. On a Wednesday, he chugs back. You may say it goes from nowhere to nowhere. Service to the community is important, but the economic backbone of the railway is express freight. This is where its future lies. Here, too, new technology is being applied to improve the efficiency of railway operations. At the Melbourne Freight Yard's hump, computers help sort the wagons according to their different destinations. Automatic retarders slow down the heavier wagons to control their speed. With the prospect of energy shortages, railways are coming into their own. When it comes to long-haul bulk freight, rail really has the advantage. the great haulage of ore, the great distances, the vast distances in this continent. There's no road haulage that can take this. That's a railway's job. There are some amazing trains in Australia. Everyone knows about the giant iron ore trains in the northwest, 
But not everyone knows that the trains serving the coal fields of central Queensland are just as impressive. They're over one and a half kilometres long. Each has an all-up weight of ten and a half thousand tonnes. They're made up of 148 wagons, hauled by six locomotives, three at the front of the train and three more in the middle. They're all controlled by the one driver via a radio-controlled unit in the centre of the train. The Indian Pacific spans the nation, from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific. It's one of the epic passenger train journeys of the world, an experience of a lifetime, to just sit back and be waited on in the old-fashioned way, and watch a whole continent unfold outside your window. men and women are the salt of the earth. My family were railway people. We heard the train whistle all our lives, it seemed. You'd hear this long wail coming, and it was a tie. It was a binding thing that bound you to other people in a very lonely, wide land. I can't hear a railway whistle without thinking of running away from home. They say it's only boys who thought that. But I think anyone who grew up within sound of that whistle, they always thought of faraway places. And of course, there was the smell. There was this incredible thing, this combination of coal and smoke. It 
tattooed itself onto the olfactory nerve of, I think, every Australian over the age of 30. Even if they're nowhere near a steam train. And somehow, if there's a slight smell of coal smoke in the air, they only have to get a whiff. Just the tang of the smoke. And it's a nostalgic shunt back to yesterday. Everything's got to change. The Romantics would like to see the steam engine come back. You can't go back. Nobody goes back. In the old days, it was steam. Then diesel power and electrification. Tomorrow, who knows? One thing's for sure. The railway will be around for a few years yet. There's a lot of new thoughts, there's a lot of new ideas, a whole new tradition in the making.